Mr. Sam Vaknin, uh, uh, I'm very glad to meet you again, to talk with you again. Thank Unfortunately, you. in uh, this is happening in a very bad circumstances. Uh, this war that started on Saturday in Israel um, uh, is, is a very, very bad thing for Israel, for Palestinians, I think, and uh, for the whole world. Uh, because we saw a lot of images with uh, civilians killed, uh, tortured, uh, and these kind of images. I, I hope that someday uh, we will put an end to all of the wars. Please tell me what's your opinion about what's happening there in, uh, in Gaza, in Israel. First of all, it's important to understand that Hamas has used all its assets. Hamas will not be able to launch a similar attack in the next 20 years. Maybe. It is using everything it has, 1,000 fighters, thousands of rockets, all the assets that it had. It's one desperate last ditch throw of the dice. It's a make or break. For Hamas. Why did Hamas speculate this way? Why is it risking its own existence? For two reasons, I think. Number one, the popularity of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, let alone in the West Bank, was going down dramatically because of corruption of Hamas officials, lack of proper governance, inability to produce results and to take care of the economy, uh, clashes between the Hamas and other factions of Palestinian politics, and so on and so forth. Hamas was losing in popularity and it needed to restore its popularity and its credentials as the organization that is fighting Israeli occupation. The one group of Palestinians who never compromise and will get things done, will obtain the results. The second reason is even more important. Israel was reconciling with other Arab countries, Morocco and so on. Lately, there has been discussion of a normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is not just any Arab country. It's the keeper of the holy shrines of Islam. It is the core of Islam. And here is Saudi Arabia willing to accept the existence of Israel, willing to establish normal diplomatic and economic relations with Israel. And all this normalization process, which started basically with Donald Trump actually, all this normalization process is at the expense of Palestinians. The agenda of the Palestinians, the interest of the Palestinians, the pain of the Palestinians is being overlooked and ignored as if the Palestinians no longer exist, as if there's only Israel and the rest of the Arab world and the Palestinians are dispensable. Hamas needed to put the Palestinians back on the map as the main item of the agenda in the Middle East, in the Arab countries, in the Muslim world, and in the United States. Yeah, but it's a map of blood. There's it's no other way it's Hamas map, reached the it's map, Hamas. Yeah, it's a map of blood of innocent civilians. Yes, Hamas yeah. and the Palestinians you, have you, reached the conclusions conclusion long time ago. Yeah. That the only way to attract the world's attention in a rapid news cycle and with numerous wars and terrorist attacks and social media and TikTok and other what the only way to attract attention is to kill innocent civilians. It is unfortunate, but it is true, actually. Now, the war between Israel and the Palestinians goes back to 1882. 1882, that's almost 150 years. The problem is that there is no solution to this conflict. That's the truth. Because the claims of the two peoples are mutually exclusive. Both of them are competing for the same tiny piece of land. It's a tiny piece of land. Both of them are competing for a tiny piece of land. Both of them claim total ownership of that piece of land. And both of them have a sacrificial mindset. They're willing to sacrifice themselves. Suicide is a common tactic in this kind of war. Also on the Israeli side, the Israelis are raised on the Masada myth, the myth of Masada, where Israelis committed, uh, Jews committed suicide when the Romans tried to take over the fortress of Masada. Suicide is in the genes, in the cultural genes of both Palestinians and Israelis. The worst enemies of Muslims are Muslims. More Muslims have been killed by Muslims than by any other religion. 
if you attack Iran, your automatic friend of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Gulf states, and so on. Automatic friend. Mm -hmm. So Israel, of course, will target very cleverly and wisely, but it would still be rogue operations with enormous potential for, for escalation, which will engulf the whole world in flames. The, the danger cannot be overestimated. People think this is a local conflict. It's not. Can you uh, give me more details? How can you see this possible escalation? Um, who do you think that might be involved in an escalation that um, might be very dangerous for the whole uh, world? It's a one to three situation. Israel will invade Gaza. Iran will support Hamas. Hezbollah will be instructed by Iran to attack Israel. Israel will attack Hezbollah. Syria will be involved. It will spread. Russia may get involved. On the which Russia side? Is, which side? How? On, how? On, on the Arab side, because Russia is no longer Israel's friend. Yeah. So Russia may be dragged into this. At, at the minimum, Iran will be dragged into this. Then Israel will retaliate against Iran. Iran is on the border with Afghanistan, with Russia, with, you know, it's too close for comfort. This way may drag Central Asia into the picture, Turkey into the picture. Definitely, we are looking at a serious potential for international conflagration. Serious potential. I don't think I'm exaggerating, and I don't think it's hyperbole. This conflict in Israel, if uh, it will escalate, if, if it will not be stopped soon, uh, if it will escalate, uh, this will uh, be in favor of Putin regarding the war of Ukraine. Of course. How do you see this? Well, that's precisely the reason why I mentioned that Russia may be dragged in, because it's one hell of a way of, for Russia to divert attention from the crisis in Ukraine and to fight the West by proxy. Russia would have a vested interest. China already make, made noises in support of Hamas, which is a bit unusual even for China. So now China and Russia and, you know, and other BRICS members, they begin to consider themselves as an alternative to the West. I'm telling you, this is not a local conflict. It appears to be a local conflict. It's not. Hamas would have never attacked Israel, never, in a million years, had it not been guaranteed to have support from outside forces, such as Iran, possibly Russia as well, but definitely Iran. Something is going on here, which is much bigger than you know, 600 dead Israelis. Although there's been a major intelligence failure uh, for example, the Hamas has acquired special boats and special paragliders, military paragliders, and even drones. And Israel was not aware of this. Yeah. Which is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. And they didn't buy only one boat. Israel has already intercepted seven boats. Now, these boats are in the international market, it's true, but there are not too many sellers of military boats. <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, I don't know. Israel should have been aware that the Hamas is buying military boats in commercial quantities. You know? And they, there's a massive intelligence failure. So. And there is also the, let's say, the religion factor. Yes, of People. course, there's history, the symbolism, there are cultural elements. There's a lot of baggage that goes with this ostensibly geopolitical conflict. It's not merely a geopolitical conflict. The whole thing started with Al-Aqsa, the mosque, in in the in Jerusalem, the attack of Hamas on Israel is, was called was called the Al Aqsa flood. Hamas said that it is attacking Israel because too many Israeli tourists and visitors are trampling on the sacred grounds of Al Aqsa. The the pretext, the excuse, was religious, but there are still many many people. There is a majority of people who are motivated by such may I say nonsense. You know? They, are, they still can be aggravated and become suicidal if, con if they're confronted with some religious infraction or some religious transgression. And it's not only religion, because I think one thing that the West does not understand, and the East does not understand, is that Judaism is not only a religion, it's a nationality. There, uh, Islam is the same. Islam is not only a religion, it's a nationality. It's called Ummah. Ummah means nation. So these particular religions 
are not only, they don't only possess the power of religion, they possess the power of the nation state. They are also cultural spheres. So it's a clash of civilization. Huntington was right. It's not a clash of religions because we have had clashes of religion. For example, we have the Crusades, Christianity against Islam and so on. That's not the same here. It's total in the sense that it's a clash of national interests, cultural spheres, and religion. When Judaism is fighting Islam, it's a fight about the definition of the world in every possible way, culturally, socially, religiously, nationally, you name it. No element is left. You know when compromise is possible in international affairs? When there are elements where you can be in agreement with your enemy. If you have something in common with your enemy, you can make peace. The Germans and the French had something in common, European identity, European culture. They had something in common. They had a clash about nationalist interests, the German Lebensraum, and so on. Yeah, there was a clash about nationalism, but there was no clash about culture. There was no clash about civilization. There was a clash about music. Mozart was very popular in France, you know. They had a lot in common, but the Jews and the Muslims have nothing in common, nothing in principle in common. They are, the, the fight, the conflict cuts across every possible dimension. So there is no ground for compromise or divorce or consensus. So you think that uh, in the next century, we, we might have the same problems? It is a perpetual conflict. And yet we haven't seen any space war between Russia and the United States over the moon, or Mars. This teaches us that it is possible to reach an accommodation, a peaceful accommodation between powers and even superpowers regarding specific uh, territories. The problem is never territory. The problem is the symbolic sphere. We are fighting over symbols because we are, we are creatures of dreams. We are storytellers. We die for fiction. We never die for reality. You die for the nation state. What the hell is a nation state? It's nonsense. It's a story. You die for a piece of cloth known as the flag. What the hell is a flag? And yet you die for it. We die for symbols. We never die for reality. And in Antarctica, it was a virgin territory. So there were no symbols there. There was no heritage. There was no culture. There was no religion. No past. When we are embedded in the present and with an outlook to the future, we collaborate very well as a species. Another example is Australia. Australia is a continent, you know. I, did, I didn't see China invading Australia in order to counter the British Empire. Or, you know, I didn't see war there. There's no war there. Why? Because Australia has no history, has no past. I know Australians will be very angry at this, but that's the truth. They are, it's a totally present society. There's no past. When we don't have a past, we, know, we don't fight. We collaborate, actually. Unfortunately, today, we have a movement, especially in the West, but not only, a reactionary movement, back to traditions, back to symbols, back to religion, away from enlightenment, away from science, away from knowledge. We have this reactionary wave which will drive us into belligerence and war and conflict. In periods of uncertainty, you revert to religion, to symbolism, to tradition, to, and then this provokes somehow aggressive, violent, primitive, atavistic instincts. I'm not quite sure what is the connection, but I know there is a connection. Because where there are, there's no tradition and no history, like Antarctica, like the moon, like the space station, like science. No tradition in history in science. You know what is science based on? No past. And no nation, no specific nation. Science no nation, no organizing principle. Everybody. No nation, no tradition, no religion, no, and no past. It's very important. Science is no past. You don't say, for example, I am never going to accept Albert Einstein because I have Newton. You know, there's no past. Albert Einstein came with through, through Newton to the garbage. We don't have an adherence to the past. We don't have loyalty to the past. We live in the present in science, 100% in the present. What's the latest? What's the latest discovery? What's the latest theory? We don't care about the past. So, of course, Russians, 
Ukrainians, uh, Israelis, and Palestinians are working in perfect harmony in science. Even to some extent in media, you know, I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. The managing editor of Brussels Morning and my direct boss, so to speak, he's a Palestinian from Gaza. I never had any problem with that. 